you remember uh, Bacon numbers? People used to figure out the Bacon numbers between... Right, yes, Kevin Bacon. Various actors. Yeah. Uh, so I think I actually have a Bacon number of two with Amy Adams. How so? I'm legitimately jealous now. <laughs> because I was once on a CBC show as like a background performer. I actually had a name so that... I remember this. Yeah. I looked up this clip. Yeah. So uh, I was once on the CBC show and the actor on that show who plays like the uh, comic relief. Yes. He was in Arrival with Amy Adams. Oh. So there's like a one, two kind of jump between me and Amy Adams. And the, the weird thing too is I'm actually... Because of that role on that show, I'm also a bacon number of one with uh, Russell Crowe. Oh. Well, wasn't he on that show? For like um, a couple of episodes, I think. He did a uh, he did like a season premiere kind of thing because he's friends with uh, the front man of Great Big C, who's like, a, you know, a recurring character on that show. Huh. I wonder what my number is. I guess you'd have to like, uh, you'd have to figure out if you've ever done any like community theater or like worked in, in like any capacity with a well no because like my parents next door neighbors a cinematographer okay and uh one time there is an actor called uh, his name is tom cavanaugh oh yeah he plays zoom i think on the flash tv show he plays the villain um he hit my car once <laughs> So I talked to him on the phone once. <laughs> How does the bacon number actually work, though? Because is it? I, I read like one person's definition was that you had to have done some sort of like material work with a person in order to well, to have that. We did insurance work. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. Like I don't know. It, it, obviously, it's all kind of like made up anyway. But the bacon numbers that is so like whatever. I'm sure <laughs> uh, people wouldn't question it. But uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. By the by, the, like the. The most common definition that I've heard, uh, yeah, my bacon number with Amy Adams would be two. Um, also, because I worked with that guy, um, his name is Mark O'Brien. He's actually on uh, Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, uh -huh. So that uh, links me up with Mackenzie Davis and Charlize Theron. And see, now you're just showing. Mom. Yeah. So it's it, but it's crazy. Like you, um, and it also kind of shows how silly the the bacon number thing is because I I think there's a website that helps you plug in like two people's names and figure out what their bacon number is. It, the vast majority of times, like people's bacon numbers are usually two or three anyway. So it's actually it's rare to get somebody who's like seven degrees away from somebody like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon thing. Just tells you how extensive uh, Kevin Bacon's career has been. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyways, that was just a fun little fact that uh, that occurred to me the other day, and maybe it uh, increases my my star power a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's reaching a little wrong. Yeah, yeah. And for anyone who's curious, uh, the clip in question comes up in season three of a CBC, uh, it's a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation show called Republic of Doyle. Uh, check it out. I think it's on Netflix, at least Netflix Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, with that really weird plug out of the way, maybe let's start the show. Welcome to another episode of the Extra Buttery Podcast. This time on the show, we've got a uh, pretty packed lineup for you. We'll be touching on some news right out of the gate, a few little tidbits from uh, upcoming productions uh, that we've been keeping our eyes on. But then we'll move on over to discussing a couple of the, uh, the new movies that Jason and I have seen in the past couple of days. Uh, we're going to be looking at Ready Player One from Steven Spielberg, Isle of Dogs from Wes Anderson, and Pacific Rim Uprising, uh, the sequel to the Guillermo del Toro film from a couple of years ago. But coming to you from Toronto, my name is Robert Snow, and joining me from Vancouver is my co-host Jason Chan. How's it going? Well, I sort of already know that because you, you, you're uh, feeling under the weather, right? Yeah, I'm sick. Oh. My body aches. <laughs> We all appreciate you uh, deciding to uh, to join us anyway, despite <laughs> all of that. Bring me some damn soup. Soup. Are you like a chicken soup guy, or do you uh, do you have a different uh, cure all? Uh, you know what? I'm the only soups I don't like are cold soups. I can't get used to cold soups. Oh yeah, I I, I can't say that I've tried a whole lot of cold soups, but I I know that they exist. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a reason they're not around anymore. <laughs> like they used to be quite popular for a while. Yeah, I don't. I I couldn't get used to it. Like the flavor is fine. It's just the fact that it's cold. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's like drinking juice out of a bowl. 
It's just like, why don't you give me a glass and a straw and I'll, I'll drink it out of that, you know? Yeah, the experience is... Well, I mean, like, um, for some reason, I have, a, I have a memory of, like, Cold Soup being a minor plot point on The Simpsons one time where Lisa, <laughs> Lisa tried to make a gazpacho or something and everyone was making fun of her for it being, like, a, an elitist uh, type of dish yeah. to serve at a picnic. Yeah, I, I don't think you get cold soups in a lot of, like, family restaurants. I, I think it's more often you get those in, in fancy places that yeah, try yeah. to do different things. One of those 12-course uh, experiences. Yeah. But you know what? Nothing beats a good mushroom soup. Mm, yeah. I've had, re- like, a lot of bad French onion soups, and, and those are those common soups are are ones that can be either really good or really terrible sometimes. Yeah, I mean, sometimes for me, you just need to uh, uh, you just need to have it like the the basic ingredients. Like with French onion soup, it's got to be just the onions, the butter, the beef stock, the crouton with the melted cheese over top. Like, no, no need to toss in uh, a million different ingredients to try to uh, get a remix or something. Although there is another soup I don't really get, and that's matzo ball soup. Oh yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't say I care for that one either. Yeah, it's not really my thing. Is this a like a food podcast or a movie? I don't know. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> well, speaking of food, <laughs> yeah. On Netflix, there's a new show by David Chang. It's called Ugly Delicious, and it's oh, I watched the the pilot of this. Yeah, yeah. and and all the episodes you don't have to watch it in a row. There's no order you have to watch it in, but because uh, all the uh, episodes are quite self-contained but I, I finished the entire season in like one sitting and i think it's quite good and quite wonderful because i'm a big oh really yeah i really like the i like food culture and food history and and he really is a good host like he's not afraid to say things off the cuff for effect yeah yeah and the, uh, the, a lot of the food he eats is quite interesting to me as well so i, I don't know did you not like the pilot episode uh, yeah something about the pilot episode really rubbed me the wrong way and like i was watching is it the pizza one it was the pizza one yeah and, and i was uh i don't know if it was the structure or uh just like david chang himself but like i know my he can be really grating yes i completely agree uh, he can be really great. I, I I can't tell if it was like the um there because they do a segment where he goes on a uh delivery run with a de- like a a star delivery guy from Domino's. Domino's and something about like yeah. his kind of behind the scenes reactions to like oh man we have to go and do another one of these kind of thing. Well, it's not exactly a glamorous job, you know. No, no, but like he he made it seem like it was the worst thing in the world for him to be out there doing it. When I mean the man's a millionaire, so I. For him to like have to do another couple of minutes of of it for the sake of the show seemed like you know seemed like he was whining a little bit. <laughs> well, he may have done twenty deliveries. So. Maybe, yeah. I mean, who knows? But uh, something about his style, and I was watching with my brother, and my brother is like a pretty big fan of David Chang normally, so that's mm-hmm. why we end- we decided to check out the new show. And I don't know, both of us ended up uh, coming away from it uh, feeling a little bit. Uh, uh, annoyed by it but maybe it's worth giving another chance i mean obviously the, the first episode shouldn't be the the only thing of a, of a show that, you, that uh, you watch i think it's also the topic of pizza itself because pizza is something that is quite subjective and i, I think pe- people can be really pretentious about pizza like the guy in brooklyn who hates delivery pizza oh yeah that guy and and i'm just like dude they're completely separate categories you can't compare a wood oven pizza versus delivery pizza yeah like it's yeah. obviously going to be different Exactly. It's kind of like if you go to a Chinese restaurant in Asia versus a Chinese restaurant here, it's going to be really different. And just because you like the Chinese food here in North America and don't like the Chinese food in Asia, which I would argue is way more authentic, doesn't mean that one's necessarily better than the other. It's, mm-hmm. it's just what you like and what you grew up with. Right, right. And I have to say, I, I do kind of like Domino's pizza. Their thin, crunchy, thin crust pizza is actually quite good. I once was on a plane with the uh, the CEO of Domino's Canada, and uh, it was a um, it was a str- it was an odd experience. Why? Well, I, I don't want to disparage the man because uh, he seems like he's pretty well connected, and goodness knows what one of his employees might end up up uh, sharing this podcast with uh, with him. Well, listen, if he's a good boss, he wouldn't mind some criticism once in a while. Well, yeah, and I, I like so, but he um, I, he's just he was talking to me the whole time, the whole flight. One of those guys. Well, these guys are sales guys, man. They could talk. The, yeah. The- you're off anyway. And he gave yeah, he gave me vouchers for a couple of large pizzas and he was just he Did you use them? Um I gave them to my sister and I think she used them, but um the God damn it, Rob. <laughs> There's no Domino's anywhere near where I live in Toronto. It's the, I'd have to go like out of my way to 
uh, to go to one. So you know they deliver, right? Yes, but uh, <laughs> anyway. What's your uh, go-to pizza place in Ontario? If you say pizza, pizza, I'm gonna end our friendship right now. <laughs> but but what if the pizza pizza that happens to be close to where I live is actually uh, surprisingly good for the chain? I totally do not believe it. <laughs> pizza pizza is awful. Um. It's no, this one is actually, it, it is more than acceptable. And it, again, it ticks, it's, I'll be the judge. It's of that. in the, <laughs> uh, it's in that kind of category of like, you know, whereas some people go for the wood fired when they're feeling fancy, but then, you know, they go with the, with the delivery pizza when they, they don't want to get out and leave the house. It's the same thing but for see, me. Like the, this, this place is right down the street. I can get there. I can walk there in like four minutes. That's the thing too, though. Like wood fire pizzas don't have to be fancy and, you know, quote unquote sophisticated. Like p- p- pizza is a very True. communal yeah. food and it, it's very simple. And, and I, I hate people who make pizza into this like super expensive thing where they like put gold leaves on it and shit like that. Like I, I, ca- I can't handle that stuff. And no, the other topping I, I, I can't handle at all is pineapple. <laughs> You're not a Hawaiian guy. I'm no, I hate it. I, I think pineapple and any kind of fruit does not belong on any entree and see again we we differ because i'm perfectly fine with it now i won't say that it'll be the first thing i'd order but if someone put it in front of me i'd i glad i gladly eat it uh, no i'd pick out the pineapples and eat the ham pizza first and then save the pineapple as dessert <laughs> I, I i can't handle it together okay so if you ever go to a chinese restaurant a lot of times they give you this fruit salad dish oh yeah and all it is is like a bunch of cut up fruit usually melon right with mayonnaise uh. And it's one of like the most weird, but not so disgusting, but not quite good things that you could eat. But people love this stuff. Yeah, no. And so I, it's just like something I can't get over. Like I can't, I know they use sometimes fruit in savory dishes, but I generally like to keep them separate. Yep. Anyway, check out Ugly Delicious. There's a couple episodes in there that are really interesting. There's one that he goes to Japan in search of a yakitori place with just like barbecue skewers and it's quite wonderful like I know he's really grating but he he can really come off as someone who genuinely really loves food as well Mm, okay yeah I I can guarantee you that even though I've never been to his restaurant Momofuku that it's not quite my kind of food right right but there's also an episode he goes back to Virginia and cooks like a Thanksgiving meal with his family and that's quite awesome actually oh okay yeah well since we're sort of in the category of like uh, quick little stories a couple of the other things that kind of caught my eye uh, the past couple of days uh, one was the casting of Adam Sandler in the new project from the Safdie brothers did um was i telling you at all about the uh, their most recent movie uh, good time no i don't seek out robert pattinson film so tell me about it tell me about good time i just know it's about like a bank robbery or something yeah yeah well i mean the safety brothers i mean they're actually a, a kind of a surprising duo because they've been steadily working away in the uh, indie film circuit for uh, the past couple of years now usually like writing and directing feature length films very gritty stuff like made on super low budgets but they've been building up a name for themselves very steadily and you know they've they're really plugged in with the whole uh, film establishment in a surprising way like they've already been to con a bunch of times they they know all of these really eccentric and um, underground directors they're they're uh, they pop up on like uh special features for criterion collection blu-rays pretty frequently um as like commentators so they're uh that they kind of have that going for them but they made this movie called uh, good time uh last year with robert pattinson as this uh skeevy not super successful bank robber who convinces his brother who suffers from a uh mental handicap uh, into helping him out with a bank heist and they just basically rob the teller at gunpoint they have a, a you know a good part of the heist figured out you know they've got masks they've got uh, plans to ditch their clothes as soon as they get out of the building plans to um, how to evade the cops once the alarms are pulled all of that but obviously because the uh, the brother played by one of the safties in fact he can't quite keep up with Robert Pattinson's character when they're escaping from the cops gets captured and sent off to jail and so Robert Pattinson's character has to spend the rest of the movie trying to uh, pull together the money to uh, bail the, bail his brother out of prison because he knows that because of his brother's um, disability he's going to be basically tortured when he's in prison so uh, it becomes this kind of mad dash through the night type of uh, story. And Robert Pattinson, is, he plays such a 
unlikable character, but it's amazing how well uh, or how how the Safties twist things around to actually make you root for him at the end of it. It's uh, it was it was pretty impressive stuff. I kind of find him unlikable to begin with, anyway. Have you? How many of his post Twilight movies have you seen? I can honestly say I can't remember the last time I've seen Robert Pattinson in a movie. Ah, see, there you go. You have to give him a shot because he's done a few little projects here and there ever since the Twilight years that have like kind of like uh, his co-star Kristen Stewart. Really, kind Her, of- yeah, she's really turned out to be like a really versatile. Yeah, really different actress, and and so like I feel like the two of them. I mean, they're, they're they're not. It's not like they're doing movies together, but they're moving on kind of parallel tracks where they've essentially said that they recognize the uh, reputation that they might have from mainstream moviegoers for being in such a you know critically derided franchise, uh-huh. and they've they've set out to kind of very um, deliberately choose movie roles that really challenge them, that really that maybe not everyone sees, but are worth checking out if you can find. I them. wonder if there's any parallel with their careers and the careers of the people from Harry Potter. Oh yeah. That, that would kind of be a cool little, uh, side by side to do. Yeah. Um, I think so too. So like, what's the film? Like, what does it feel like? How do they direct? What's their tone? It's very gritty. Very, a lot of handheld cinematography, uh-huh. lots of kind of, uh, like the main character played by, uh, Pattinson in good time. Uh, there's a sequence where he kind of cons his way into an old woman's house late at night so he can use her phone And then he ends up like befriending the teenage granddaughter of the woman Uh and convincing uh, and like starting to make out with the with the granddaughter and convinces the granddaughter to like give him a ride to a nearby place where he's stashed some drugs that he can sell. Uh And he does all of these things that just make you want to like pull back from the screen and make you feel like really hairs going up in the back of your neck. It just feels like really disturbing behavior. But he sounds like a very interesting character. Actually. Yeah, but he is very interesting because he's the hero of the movie. And ultimately, everything that he's doing, all the people that he's screwing over, all of the cunning stuff that he does to get what he wants is all in the service of trying to protect his brother from awful treatment in prison. It kind of draws you in in that way. And there's there's something of very lived in and very kind of confident about the way the Safdies made the movie. Um, it feels like they they're, they're much older than they are that they have a lot more experience than they do, which is kind of cool. So now they've you know you know I guess riding on the success of Good Time and all of the uh, the critical notices it got, they've been able to bag Adam Sandler for their upcoming movie, which I think is called um, Uncut Gems. Adam Sandler is a very underrated dramatic actor. I've always held that belief, even though he's made some really really bad films. I don't ever think he's the worst part of the film right and like you know people will often cite punch drunk love or even uh the movie he made for noah bombach last year um direct to netflix um the meyerowitz stories that was really good it was really good well he's he's done actually quite a bit there is also um the one with the 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 story about the comedians what's that freaking name oh funny people funny people yes and rain over me i think don Cheadle was in that one I was actually one of the few that didn't mind Spanglish. I thought it was an okay film. Yep, that's another one. And yeah, so like, I I think he makes all these really stupid comedies because it makes him a lot of money and he can cast his friends in it. But I honestly think that his career would have been kind of different had he really focused on the dramatic stuff. Yeah, I mean, who knows what his career would have looked like if he'd just been a dramatic actor the whole time. I mean, it... uh... I think he's got a lot of range. I think a lot of comedians have a lot of range, but they just don't get the same respect because I I think they get pigeonholed as a comedian, kind of like Jim Carrey. Yeah, and that's something Jim Carrey talks about in that uh, Netflix documentary, you know, the... Yes, uh, which I found fascinating. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think we talked about it on a... We we talked about it on a show uh, yes. a couple episodes ago, but yeah, like this this persistent thing with uh, with comedians, you know, they they'll announce that they're going to be in some sort of upcoming dramatic project, and people will go, "Oh, is they really right for that? Oh, I don't know if I can see that," because people just kind of have the um, the the comedian side of that person's work. Uh, lodged in their brain. I mean, look at what happened with the uh, the Freddie Mercury biopic. Um, yes, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen was announced to uh, to be 
uh, leading that project, both as a as a playing Freddie Mercury and as a producer. And the uh, the family of uh, Freddie Mercury almost went to court, I think, to try to stop it from happening because they they seem to think that Sacha Baron Cohen's previous comedy work disqualified him from being able to play Freddie Mercury. I thought the story was more that there were a lot of things that Sacha Baron Cohen wanted to depict in the film that a lot of the people in the family didn't want him to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was an issue as well. Like, I think they, they wanted to kind of lay bare some of the drug abuse and the uh, obviously the, the fact that um, Freddie Mercury was in the closet for much of the time that he was in yes. Queen. So uh, they wanted to dive into all of that. But uh, yeah, the family wasn't interested. Yeah, I think that was the the bigger issue there. But the funny thing is, though, like, it seems to be harder for comedians. Like, remember when Heath Ledger was cast as the Joker and people were like, oh, what the hell? And then everyone saw the performance and everyone was, like, transformed. Everyone's opinions had almost changed overnight. Yeah. We haven't seen yeah. the same kind of effect for anyone who went from comedy to drama, really. I think the closest I can think of is when Nicolas Cage, who is, like, at that time, doing all sorts of weird films and, and some of them were action films. He did adaptation and people were like, oh, OK, all right. Well, like, I think he's got something here. But even then, he's it's kind of forgotten now because he does all sorts of dumb movies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or just like completely balls to the wall movies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, uh, I, re- I vaguely remember when adaptation came out and uh, that being. Uh, kind of the, part of the focus of the conversation and Matthew McConaughey too right like yeah he wasn't a comedian per se but he was like an action star he was like a rom-com dude. oh yeah big time rom-com guy but all of a sudden like people consider him like a really good dramatic actor which he can be but I, I just when it comes to transformations it seems like comedians always seem to be thought of as comedians only yeah it's it's sort of like a it's kind of like a double function of Hollywood or the casting agents or the producers typecasting people to an extent, but then it's also the, uh, it, it also falls on the audience a little bit too, because they, a lot of times audience members will, they'll form a very uh, solid stereotype around a particular actor and apply that when they go to see some of the, the actors more experimental stuff. And then they'll say, Oh, I, I just can't see that person in that role. And I'm like, but they're an actor. It's their job to be in different roles. Like, mm-hmm. um, uh, you quiz almost any comedic actor, and they probably are interested in doing drama in some capacity and at some point in their career. Speaking of McConaughey, True Detective three, eh? Yeah. So like, uh, apparently, there's a little bit of trouble on the True Detective set because the the director who was hired for the first three episodes of this third season, which will be like again, a, like the two uh, previous seasons, a, a totally different story from the other ones. They had hired a guy by the name of Jeremy Saulnier to direct these first three episodes, and he was going to be working with the showrunner Nick Pizzolatto. Yeah. If there's anything we've learned, though, is that it seems like no one can work with Nick Pizzolatto. Yeah, because Kerry Fukunaga was uh, was on season one, and then he didn't come back for... Uh, season two and some people kind of pinned the broken storytelling or the um, inconsistent tone in season two of true detective on a lack of a uh, working creative partnership between pizzolato and his directors isn't pizzolato directing this time around as well he might have a credit on a few episodes yeah but um the uh, the core, the first three episodes were going to be done by this guy, Saulnier, who some people might remember from a couple of really strong indie movies that um, came out in the past couple of years. Uh, first one was uh, Blue Ruin uh, with uh, Macon Blair. Really, really cool uh, neo-noir. And then after that, he did a movie with Patrick Stewart and Anton Yelchin called Green Room. That was also really, really good. Both of them are very gory, very violent, mm-hmm. but um, uh, he kind of established uh, Saulnier establish himself as this talent to watch essentially and it made a lot of sense when he was brought in to direct these these first three episodes of uh, true detective like the tone of true detective is very much in line with the stuff that sonya has already done so i was kind of excited when i saw that uh Sonia's name was on the production and to hear that maybe he's not uh blending very well with uh, pizzolato's style is uh I guess maybe not a surprise, but also kind of unfortunate. Well, we'll see, right? Like, if True Detective Season 3 doesn't work out well, I can't see a Season 4 ever being made. Yeah, but then again, they said that about Season 2, and uh, they, they still managed to. You know you know what? There were certain parts of Season 2 that I thought were, were pretty good. It's just, as a whole, it wasn't very good. 
So I think people are, like me are willing to give it another chance. But if season three is a bomb, then I'm done. Like, I'm just not yeah. that interested anymore. <laughs> I think this is the make it or break it season for True Detective. And but I mean, there there's still a lot of reasons to to check it out too. I mean, uh, Mahershala Ali is uh, going to be yes. playing one of the uh, the, the two uh, main uh, police detectives. You know that the show's going to revolve around. Um, I think uh, Carmen Ejogo is that how you pronounce her name? Mm-hmm. Uh, she's going to be playing a, a school teacher, I believe, that uh, is sort of at the middle of the mystery. A few other names are also in the mix, but uh, I think Stephen Dorff might play the other cop. But yeah, I mean, it's it sounds uh, from the the synopses that we've read so far, this new season sounds like more of a return to the storytelling style from the first season. So, uh, you know, there's going to be a multi-decade mystery and there's going to be more of a rural bent to it. The the problem with a lot of these miniseries is that they tend to drag on longer than they should. Yeah. So if they can keep it compact and keep it interesting, at least from episode to episode, I think it has a real chance to do really well. The problem with season two was that it was very disjointed. Certain subplots were introduced way too late in the episodes to really catch on and it felt like there were too many moving parts mm, yep. going around whereas in season one it was really self-contained it was really about um woody harrelson and matthew mcconaughey and i hope that they get it right this time because i i really really love these thriller police procedural kind of shows shows that always sort of bring in new storylines or use a different cast every season Kind of like The Wire and uh, what's the... Uh, Fargo is doing it too. Yeah, the Fargo. So those kind of shows I think really, really interest me the most. So if True Detective is good, it's just another one I can waste some time on. <laughs> But let's uh, let's uh, jump on over to some of the uh, the big new releases that uh, we teased in the the intro um, because uh, I think uh, both of us have been pretty busy uh, watching some of the yes. uh, the movies that have come out in the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, should we start with uh, with one that we've both seen? Maybe uh, Ready Player One. Sure, I'm surprised that uh, I kind of gave this one a higher rating than you did. Yeah, I noticed that on Letterboxd, and I was like, "Wow, this this only happens like a couple of times a year." Where uh, I know <laughs> we go opposite uh, from our usual patterns, but um, uh, no, I, I well maybe maybe give me your take on it then, uh, since uh, I, oh, I was going to ask you what. Did you not like about it? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> exasperated sigh. I I don't know if if I'm being influenced by having read the entire book or not. Mm-hmm. I heard it's quite different from the it book. is. Yeah, there's uh, there there are a lot of differences. So when you if you've read the book, especially like fairly recently before seeing the movie, I I had to like mentally sort of unhook myself from what I knew about the the book's plot because uh, I I could tell that if I fixated too much on the differences, you know, obviously I, I wouldn't really be watching the movie. I would just be kind of comparing, uh, comparing what's in, what's out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, and the, another thing too, about, uh, watching it was trying to, it was impossible not to see the movie in the context of the discussion that had led up to the movie coming out, which was how are they going to deal with some of the less than savory aspects of the main character, um, how are they going to deal with uh, the book writer uh, Ernest Klein's penchant for just like page after page of pop culture references with very little connective tissue? Yeah, I've read a couple pages of his book. It's not the prose is not good. Yeah, so like anybody who's familiar with that, and then going into the movie, you uh, if you know that there's already been a, basically an internet shouting match uh, in advance of the the movie coming out, you're kind of like, oh well, how does the, the movie actually deliver or not deliver on the, uh, all those expectations? But setting all that aside, I'm kind of of two minds on the movie, and I I put this in the the review that I posted on the site as well. The the one good thing that the movie does is it it kind of diffuses some of the crazy obsession of Wade Watts, the main character, and it doesn't make him quite as obviously like a base, basically an antisocial crazy person who memorizes the scripts of entire movies or drops like every second of his time not spent like sleeping or eating memorizing 1980s pop culture so they kind of they trim all of that back and they make him feel a little bit more like a human i like that but 
Mm -hmm. almost by making him more palatable as a character. They also make the whole thing less interesting because they, it kind of robs the movie of a chance to critique the character for that type of behavior. Right. Uh, So it's kind of a, you know, I, I almost would have preferred a movie that presented Wade Watts with all of his warts uh, and, then kind of needled him a little bit about it and showed why he was wrong to uh, conduct himself that way or why why it was weird to kind of be stalkerish towards his love interest character, the one played by Olivia Cook. Because if he had done that, like he does in the book, you would be kind of wrestling with a very flawed character. And that would have been a very cool experience. But instead, it you know, uh, Steven Spielberg does what I think a lot of people might have expected anyway and makes of solid piece of entertainment um i don't know did you did you feel the same way like were you well, were you kind of wrapped up in that entertainment side of it well he, here's the thing when i whenever i go into a steven spielberg movie i expect something very family friendly i expect a very likable protagonist mm-hmm. i expect it to touch on certain issues but not go too deep i don't expect it to be very controversial in any way shape or form (laughs) and that's kind of exactly what i got like you'd have to go pretty far back in spielberg's career to find like a movie where he really really makes some sort of social commentary or he makes something that is more geared towards adults than kids Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i think in in that sense i think ready player one was executed quite well um i didn't have any real problems with it But that in itself is a problem because I think Spielberg movies are fun for two hours, but they don't leave you with any lasting impression. I think you're right in that they could have said more things about um, virtual reality and and how people get addicted to these things, basically. Yeah, yeah. I didn't expect it to really go down that path, though, so I wasn't terribly disappointed it didn't go down that path. I thought the production value was great, as with any Spielberg film. The one thing that really kind of bugged me, though, was the amount of exposition in this film. Oh, yeah. It was borderline annoying. And I think there are times where maybe it was because of the exposition, maybe because things took a lot longer to develop than I than I thought. I thought the pace wasn't very good. I thought there were certain parts where they really could have sped it along. There are certain lines of dialogue that were completely cheesy uh, that really made me laugh, especially the part where Z kind of declares his love for Artemis. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I I thought that was kind of uh, funny in a way. Well, I mean, that was that was actually an improvement over the similar sequence in the book, which was uh, was just totally cringe inducing. And, you know, if you're if you were if you're made uncomfortable by the movie version, uh, I can only like tell you that it would have been five times as bad if you were reading it in uh, Klein's voice. The Oasis was the brainchild of James Halliday. Hello. If you're watching this, I'm dead. I created a hidden object, an Easter egg. The first person to find the egg will inherit half a trillion dollars and total control of the Oasis itself. Who is this? Horizable. And how the hell is he winning? Find him. This isn't just a game. I'm talking about actual life and death stuff. I don't think this movie is one of Spielberg's best at all. No, no. I think he's gotten to the point where his movies, to me, are just generic, family-friendly affairs. I, I don't expect him to ever make anything like Save It Private Ryan or even Munich anything like that i think he's really gone away from that kind of stuff yeah well i was kind of hoping that he might dip his toe a little bit into the flavor of minority report because if there's any minority report is excellent you know if there's any um movie that would have you know i'm not saying the entire movie would have to look like minority report or have that kind of oppressive um uh post almost post-apocalyptic but still kind of vaguely utopian feeling uh, it would be Ready Player One because you know the the Oasis, the the uh, immersive video game that uh, everyone in the Ready Player One universe is plugged into almost all the time. It it has a, that same kind of like abused potential 
uh, that the uh, the precogs in Minority Report have, you know, mm-hmm. developed with a with an eye to solving humanity's problems, but uh, slowly gets abused and corrupted over time. So yeah, I mean, the what what ends up happening in Ready Player One is rather than kind of explore the darkest corners of the premise, he kind of stays a little bit more on the surface and says like, oh well, you know, it's uh, it's just a bunch of kids, you know, reclaiming this thing from the evil corporate guy played by Ben Mendelsohn. Yeah, and there's some toss-away line at the end where he's like, oh, yeah, you know, reality is still so much better than virtual reality. That's why we close it on Tuesdays and Thursdays or something like that. Yeah, and I was thinking, like, that's a little bit of a a hand wave type of way to end a film where, you know, all of the problems that drive people to use the Oasis and get lost in it are ostensibly still happening. So it, it seemed a little bit kind of tone deaf almost to... To, to suggest that like oh suddenly everything's great because these two kids get, are have uh, shacked up yeah and it's a movie where like the protagonist Ty Sheridan is kind of flawless in the sense that people just kind of follow him yeah and he's got that kind of like Spielbergian uh, the you know lots of shots of the starry eyed kind of looking out yeah. into an object we can't see kind of thing it's like the movie really wants you to believe that he's a hero that he's worth rooting for and I have no problem with that it's just every Spielberg film is like this and that's why I'm He's not one of my favorites because I find his films tend to be, especially now, very predictable Mm. and not very, doesn't make me think about it a whole lot. You kind of take it for what it is and it's a good piece of entertainment. Yeah. Now, I will say that a couple of things that I I did really like about it were, and there have been a few other critics who have uh, called out these scenes as well, uh, the opening car chase uh, sequence that becomes the quest to get the one of the keys necessary to get yep. the the central MacGuffin in the film um, that was added for the movie that, that didn't occur in the book and um, it really does a good job of kind of better than any of the exposition off the top of the film it does a really good job of exploring the potential of the oasis and how all of these different things like King Kong and Mario Kart and you know uh, video game style mechanics can all come together in one kind of crazy chaotic sequence and it introduces you to the Oasis in a way that, like, the voiceover never could. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was really cool. Also, the sequence where they go to the Overlook Hotel from The Shining and throw in zombies and... Um, Actually, that part was really... Giant cool. axes uh, slicing their way through the hedge labyrinth. Stuff like that, like uh, riffing on well-established pop culture things. Those those sequences were for me a whole lot better than just like name checking random characters that you see in the background, which, you know, a lot of the blogs and culture sites seem to be drawing up all these lists of like 130 Easter eggs that you missed in Ready Player One. And I'm like, I don't care if a character from some random video game was in one shot for uh, half a second. Like, but a lot of people do. And and that was kind of like the reasons why Ernest Klein's novel was so successful though, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it had had all these like pop culture tie-ins that I think had you not done fan service, uh, people would have been really disappointed. Oh yeah, I mean, you if they hadn't have included those scenes, you know, it wouldn't have felt like the like the source book at all, you know, it would have it would have almost been its own thing entirely. Yeah, people who I think people who get a little bit too caught up in identifying all of the cameos and all of the references, they're not really getting the point of the movie, which was to uh, <laughs> repudiate some of that behavior. And like, because the one thing the the movie doesn't do, uh, which is which is a good thing, is it doesn't act like a gatekeeper to culture. Like, have you ever heard of, of dudes who like like hardcore fanboys for of stuff like Rick and Morty or? Uh, Uh, various video games who like will go up to people in real life if they see them wearing like a Legend of Zelda t-shirt or a Star Wars t-shirt and quiz them about their knowledge about the thing because they don't believe that the person wearing the shirt uh, or buying the poster um, actually is a real fan that's no that's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard though I know but they exist they, they actually do exist and they're certainly they're obviously more prevalent online like you'll you'll see people like sharing an image from a new uh, video game and people will pile into the comments saying oh you don't really know about that thing like how much do you really know about that thing and it's it's really toxic behavior and it's kind of a the the ultimate expression of geek culture or like the the, the extreme of geek culture um, so that's what the book did and the movie shies away from that i think in a, in a in a good way but the movie still sort of depicts um ty sheridan's character as this like 
really likable nerd, which is like popular character to play these days. So in, in that sense, he there is he does do a little bit of gatekeeping. It's just that he um, doesn't really have the qualities of some of the worst parts of nerdism. Yeah, and that's kind of how they cleaned him up. You know, I mean, he the version of although him, there's a there's borderline. You know, like there are times where he comes off as really really creepy and and kind of uh, neck beardish. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, like the fact that they stepped back from how he was in the book should be a testament to uh, how extreme of a version of that he was in Klein's book. And there's so many, like there is so many creepy sequences. The one that really sticks in, in my brain from the, from the novel was uh, um, when, when he gets rejected by Artemis, uh, the character played by uh, Olivia Cook in the movie um, in the book, he retreats to a apartment, which he locks himself in uh, 24 seven for months on end. He shaves off all of his body hair, including everything on his head and uses chemicals to like keep himself hairless and then lives inside of his haptic suit that he uh, needs to control stuff in the in the game and basically just puts like 20 hours or like 23 hours a day into being in that online world and it's like a it's like a terrifying sequence and that is weird that is almost like serial killer yeah and the book doesn't uh repudiate him for that behavior it almost suggests that this behavior was necessary for him to get to an advanced level in the game Uh uh-huh um and I was glad to see that sequence either not in the film or if it was going to be in the film, I would have hoped that they would have called him on that because yeah, that moments like that are just, uh, I'm supposed to root for this guy. Like anyway. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of games out there that force you to grind. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Part of it. It's like one of the core game mechanics in some uh, recent games. Yeah. Which I hate. Not that I play a lot of video games, but I, I just hate grinding. I just I don't have the patience or the time for that kind of stuff. But would you pay for uh, the chance to get around the grinding? No, and that's the whole issue with the video game industry these days, isn't it? Yeah, the microtransactions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it's been banned in in certain countries because it's a form of gambling. And a couple of a couple of companies are kind of eating some humble pie lately, and they've been uh, releasing patches for their games that remove microtransactions from the game uh, post release. Because it's the the systems that they've put into the games on launch have been so incredibly unpopular. So yeah, that's that type of behavior is was initially encouraged by the game industry, and then it was kind of monetized, and now people are kind of walking that back. But no, I think um, like overall, I gave I, I gave Ready Player One uh, two and a half out of four, or three out of five, depending on what what scale you're using. Yeah, I would have gone two two and a half out of four, and I think I gave it three and a half out of five. Right, just because it. It didn't exceed my expectations. It, it kind of met them, and it was a fine movie. I just, unless you're really interested in that kind of pop culture stuff or Ernest Klein's novel, I I feel like you could skip it and you wouldn't really miss anything. It's been a, it's been a while since Spielberg has come out with a film that's I think really captivated audiences. Mm, yeah, that that's really like defined the culture. Oh well, I mean the man's seventy one, so maybe uh, maybe he's only got a few more left in him anyway. Well, I'm sure he's got tons more films. I just think he's really moved towards like kid friendly, family oriented stuff because I think in a sense that stuff is much easier. Yeah, or... than say Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> I mean that, that stuff can be. I've never directed or, or acted, but I'm sure the the production and the process itself can be quite mentally draining. Mm. Yeah. So maybe he's just, you know, he's just decided to, you know, I'm I'm winding down my career. I prefer to have fun with it rather than than make any sort of statement. Sure. I mean, no shame in that, obviously, but um, uh, it does it, it does mark a bit of a transition in his career. I think. Uh, jumping from that, maybe we'll talk about uh, Isle of Dogs because I know Wes Anderson can be a bit of a uh, uh, sticking point between uh, you and I. Yes, yes. So. Oh, well, I'm just going to say that uh, I recognize the uh, cultural insensitivity or the, the cultural um, appropriation uh, argument that's raging <laughs> over this film. Yeah. I can't say I 100% uh, understand it. I think maybe you, you, uh, you would have to see it and tell me where you land with it for us to have like a, f- a real discussion on it. Uh, I will recommend though a video that uh, the LA Times published. It's a discussion between uh, one of their film critics, uh, David Chang and Justin Chang. Um, 
or Justin Chang, yeah, and uh, Jen Yamato is a film writer uh, for them. Uh, they get into a really in-depth conversation about that very issue in Isle of Dogs, which um, a, a few people were trying to hammer them on Twitter about it. They were trying to uh, minimize their concerns or make them, uh, you know, shout them down. But I, I think what they have to say in that video is, is still very valid. So it's it's worth checking out if you have the time. I can I can definitely see the spots within Isle of Dogs that that, that are causing issues for folks like Jen Yamato and Justin Chang. You know, the, this is a stop motion film. It's set in Japan. It's got, rather surprisingly for me, actually, it's got uh, human characters in it uh, speaking Japanese, but with no subtitles. Uh, it's something I didn't really absorb until about a day before I saw it. Uh, and then all of the, the the dog characters are voiced by, you know, the typical Wes Anderson uh a rogues gallery of uh, Bill Murray, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum, yeah. um, Bob Balaban, uh, Leif Schreiber. Uh, so it, you've got these two very different camps of characters in the movie. And the plot revolves around the, the dogs, who of course are voiced by all these American actors, being banished from the futuristic Japanese city uh, where the, a lot of the action begins because of a apparent dog flu that the mayor is trying to uh, combat. And uh, it's revealed that, of course, the mayor is actually a cat lover. And uh, his decision to banish all the dogs to an island off the coast is probably more motivated by his uh, general dislike of dogs and nothing to do with any actual disease. So the, the dogs find themselves on this horrible island. You know, they're just uh, fighting with each other for scraps of food that they find. Um, but one of the dogs that was banished was actually uh, the bodyguard dog of the mayor's ward, Atari. And as the action of the film kind of gets going, he flies a little plane over and crash lands on the island and sets off a quest to try to track his dog down. And it's uh, it, it's very heartwarming. It's very... Especially in the opening scenes, it heartwarming, heartwarming. Yeah, if you've ever seen a Wes Anderson film, obviously you know a certain to a certain extent what to expect. But I don't know. I feel like he does challenge himself a little bit here, and he kind of he he works in a little bit more of a combative attitude uh, to his typical cozy outlook that uh, you might not expect. Is his outlook cozy though? I. I kind of disagree because I've always found him to be, I've always found his comedy to be quite more black comedy than like burst out loud um, slapstick kind of type humor. I haven't seen the movie, obviously, but uh, Wes Anderson to me has always been a guy who really has his own voice. And I, I think the culture appropriation stuff, which I've read, but have not seen the film. So maybe I'm kind of. Not really qualified to comment about it right now, but he, I mean, he's he's done this before with some cultural appropriation in the past, has he not? Like with, uh, like with the Darjeeling Limited, yeah, maybe? with the Darjeeling Limited, which I I thought was not a good film. Um, oh no, don't hurt my feelings. <laughs> it was okay. I it's not bad. I just don't think it was very good. Um, and also, I, I think even with the Grand Budapest Hotel. Like stealing Eastern European stuff? or Yeah, Eastern European and Zero, I think, was the bellhop's name. Yep. I think it is what it is. It's in that North America cinema will always have a certain way of depicting cultures that are not their own, especially East Asian cultures. Just as in the same way, if you watch Asian films, I think sometimes they depict white people as really dumb and stupid and helpless. I think the argument goes both ways. Unless it's very egregious, I, it doesn't really affect my enjoyment of a film. I think I'd be interested to see um, Isle of Dogs just for that reason. I can't say it's a very interesting movie to me. I did skip Fantastic Fox, which was another Wes Anderson film, which is kind of done in like a similar type of animation, I believe. I'll have to see. I, Wes Anderson, I think... He has a particular niche that he occupies, and I'm not always interested in going into that niche. So we'll see. Now that you've you know talked about all that stuff, I'm actually interested to see what the movie is all about. I have a friend who's really into Isle of Dogs. We get the idea. You're looking for your lost dog spots. Does anybody know him? No. no. Uh -uh. I've lost all of my pride. 
Box, if he's alive, may very well be living even at this moment as a captive prisoner. Your uh, outlook might change a little bit, actually, when you see it, um, because uh, one of the one of the things that's kind of core to the the cultural appropriation or cultural insensitivity uh, discussion is that because the dogs are fully voiced by uh, English speaking actors and the the Japanese characters just speak Japanese and are only occasionally translated by like an English speaking interpreter character, it kind of to use the the very social justice warrior phrase, it others the Japanese characters and kind of sets them apart and makes them feel more foreign. Yeah, why does it have to be set in Japan? Well, that's the thing. And like, so I think I think it was Jen Yamato who who questioned whether if you transplanted the movie to any other part of the world, would it still work? Is the is the fact that it's in Japan intrinsically part of the movie? And I, she might have she might have something there. Um, it's hard to say, of course. Yeah. Or is it just like Wes Anderson being like, "Oh, Japan's pretty cool. Let's set in Japan." Yeah, but uh, but I mean, I think which I can totally see. I, I'm not entirely convinced by that argument because the, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but. There's a perception, at least with like North American depictions of Japanese culture, that Japanese culture is very rigid and very rule abiding. Yes. Um, and that's true. Is it more or less likely that something like an all out ban on dogs that everyone would just obey because it's the rule of the land? Would something like that be more likely to happen in Japan than it would in a different country? Well, I can tell you that in certain Asian countries, their dogs aren't treated as well as they are here. A lot right. of you'll see a lot of stray dogs in uh, in Asia, um, and it's just people being really, really shitty pet owners, and and obviously just not giving the same amount of care and, and respect to animals. But I mean, it could just be because life is super hard and they don't have time to look after the animals. Well, yeah, so. there's that, that's obviously a, a factor. Um, in the, in yeah. the case of this one, it's, it's more based on like uh, false rumors, like fake news that the mayor spreads because his family historically loves cats. And so mm -hmm. he cooks up this story about a dog flu. And then because he's so charismatic and so popular in Megasaki city, Mm -hmm. uh, the the city he's in control of people just do exactly as he says and you know he stamps the order and the dogs all get shipped off you know and in, in classic Wes Anderson style like people say things directly to the camera and then they just happen you know uh, things are always done very matter matter of factly in the Wes Anderson world so that's that's a bit of a complicating factor in that argument there's still something to be said in the movie for how how many different readings that you can make of the, the general premise. Like you can talk about the dogs as being uh, an allegory for disenfranchisement of like an immigrant population, or you can talk about them in context of like animal cruelty in scientific experiments, because that's an element in the later parts of the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's just like the the very emotional like boy and his dog kind of aspect of it. Like you have all of these sequences where the characters are framed in like very tight close ups, um, which you might not expect from a mm -hmm. stop motion animated film, very tight close ups of just their face. And, you know, they get emotional when they think about uh, like the boy that they love or in the case of the boy, the dog that they love and uh, tears come to their eyes and the vocal performances are so very carefully done. Um, that you're like, you feel yourself getting a little bit misty eyed and, uh, you know, not every stop motion animated film or even animated film can really provoke those kind of those feelings. So did you cry? Uh, no, I didn't cry, but I mean, I could see like, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, it could be a bit of a tearjerker for people, which, uh, which made me happy actually, because I'm like, yeah, this is, uh, you can't really accuse Wes Anderson of being, uh, too tidy or too emotionally uh, compartmental, you know, some people will accuse him of that, of being like, oh, you know, things are very, very neatly put in little boxes and people say things and then um, they express their emotion and then it's over to the next scene. Uh, so things are a little bit more messy in the, especially in the latter part of this one that, uh, so, uh, he, he pushed him, he pushed himself just a little bit out of his comfort zone. Okay. All right. So maybe really quickly, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, talk a little bit about, uh, Pacific Rim Uprising because, uh, that was one that, that you saw and I haven't gotten to see yet. <laughs> I, I still sort of want to see Pacific Rim Uprising because I was such a huge fan of the Guillermo del Toro original from a couple of years ago. So like I wrote in my review that will be on the website soon, I, or I, maybe I deleted it, that sentence, but uh, I used my scene points, a free movie ticket for Pacific Rim Uprising, and I'm glad I did. Oh, no. 
because had I paid for it, actually paid to see the movie, I don't think I would have been disappointed per se, but I would have been like, I wish I picked something else to watch. Oh. As a piece of entertainment, going back to Ready Player One, as we talked about, there's nothing really wrong with Pacific Rim Uprising. The premise itself is is stupid to begin with, so you can forgive the stupid subplots and some of the stupid lines. I, I think it can be quite entertaining. It's just the difference between this one and Del Toro's is so huge. I, I think there is something to be said about this sort of weird touch that Del Toro has with his films. So Pacific Rim Uprising kind of l- l- or begins where Pacific Rim left off. And so in this one, John Boyega plays Idris Elba's kid, a stacker Pentecost in the in the first film. And he's kind of like this burnout. He's, he's, he's stealing things and selling it for money on the black market. And he gets caught and gets captured by the organization that controls all the Jaegers. I can't remember the name. It's like PPDF or the Pan Pacific Def- Defense Corps. Oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. And anyway, the deal is instead of going to jail or, or suffering consequences of stealing and, and entering all these like restricted zones, he has to come back to the Shatter Dome as an instructor. And he brings along brings along this girl, his name's Amari Namani, I think. Which is I think like one of the worst fictional names you could ever have because it's so hard to say. <laughs> but the story is, is is pretty much the same as in Pacific Rim. It's 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 about people who have to work together just even though they don't like each other and to save the world from the kaiju the difference is that um with pacific rim there's an arc that you could really follow um whether it was good or not is a kind of a different story but in pacific rim uprising it's kind of like okay here's the danger we're just gonna stick some pilots in a in in a jaeger do some cgi battles and sort of call it a day. Mm, okay. And so there's very little sophistication. There's very little imagery to be really to get really excited about. Because I remember in the in the first one, you know, there was this there was this arc, especially to do with the the character played by uh, Rinko Kikuchi. Yes. Where she's kind of wrestling with whether or not she's going to be a, a decent Jaeger pilot, or whether her adoptive father, played by Idris Elba, is even going to let her drive a Jaeger. Um, and her, her her compatibility with the character played by Charlie Hunnam because you need the two of them to to run a Jaeger. Yeah, in in the film, Rinko Kikuchi's character is Mako Mori. Um, she she's kind of like getting over the death of her parents from a kaiju attack. Right, and 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 Charlie Hunnam's character is doing the same thing except it's his brother, and so they took basically took that plot and just put it back into Pacific Rim Uprising, but with two completely different characters. This uh, one being Boyega, whose dad Idris Elba died in the first film, obviously. And then Kaylee Spaney, who is the new female lead, and she's the one whose parents also died in a kaiju attack. And so uh, right. um, you don't get the sense that they're doing anything new or special. It's more of the same, but without some of the, the more interesting parts of Pacific Rim. And it's not their fault. I think most of the actors, I think, um, really made the most of what they have. I'm not the biggest John Boyega fan because I, I don't know. I, f- I feel like he's a bit much sometimes, but he's actually quite likable in this. The only guy who I really didn't like is Scott Eastwood, who I think <laughs> is probably worse than Keanu Reeves in, in this movie. Like, take Keanu Reeves. Wait, are you Reeves- saying that Keanu Reeves is in this movie? Because I would immediately have to see it. If no, no, no. Case. I'm saying take Keanu Reeves' most wooden performance. Okay. So like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, or some, or like even like The Matrix Revolutions or something like that. Right. And then that is kind of what Scott Eastwood is on his best day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not he, disagreeing he, with you because he, I can totally see it. He's gotten this habit of playing like the side character, like the good looking guy. Yeah, the military dude or... Exactly. Like he does the same in The Fast and Furious. and But he's just like a, not a very interesting character. I, I think a lot of times in this movie, I'm just going like... Okay, are you and John Boyega feuding or not? Who is that? Definitely not one of ours. Let's do this. And and there's this like other female character and there's an implied love triangle but don't really go anywhere and they make stupid jokes about it and, yeah. and it's like this movie could have been 20 minutes shorter if you cut out this part i don't want to call it too early but because obviously like uh, eastwood is pretty young but he's never seemed to me to have the kind of edge that his father has in his roles no i think he tries to yeah but it's almost like they they tried to manufacture 
a Clint Eastwood style edge in a lab and kind of inject it into Scott Eastwood. Yeah, he's got to figure out what kind of actor he Scott Eastwood is, not Scott Eastwood trying to be Clint Eastwood. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the thing there. And, and the, the other thing about this is that it falls into this trap of so many sequels where it's like, okay, we have Jaegers and Kaiju. Well, what can we make this better? Oh, I know. Let's make the Kaiju even bigger. Oh, yeah. And you're just like, oh, come on. Really? That's it? And remember in the... In, the last film, they closed the portal where the kaiju come from. Right. Yeah, it was supposed to be the final solution kind of thing. Right. And in this movie, they come back. And, and there's a character from the first film who comes back in this one. And he goes through this really, this uh, turn for the worse. He has a, his own character arc and he kind of becomes the villain. Oh, yeah. I won't say who because I don't really want to spoil it. Well, that's nice of you. I think I, I think I already know who it is, but yeah. But I, I think it's very hard to believe if if you're not already immersed in that in that world. Like, Guillermo del Toro's biggest strength is that he can come up with the craziest ideas and, like, the craziest concepts, but he can make you buy into it. Oh, yeah. He can make you feel, like, suspenseful and tense and everything, but not in Pacific Rim Uprising. And I I don't necessarily think it's the director's fault, because if you remember correctly, when they were making this film, when it was still called Pacific Rim Maelstrom and, and del Toro was still attached to it, at some point, Legendary had been sold to Wanda. Oh, yeah. And, and and so I think at some point in between, priorities changed. I think characters changed. The one thing I will give this film, though, is that there is an Asian actress in here. I think her name's Tian Jing. She's not a side piece like a lot of Asian actors in, in North American movies. She actually has lines. She actually has a, a, like a character arc in this oh, story. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, so so I'll applaud him for that. It's not a very interesting arc by any means, but I, I think it's a step in the right direction, and I have no doubts that this movie will, should make a lot of money overseas, but I mean, it doesn't even hold a torch to the first film, and it, I, I would be surprised if there was a sequel, mm. and this is one of those sequels that also was a little unnecessary. Were they able to replicate any of the the little kind of like visual uh, like sight gags that uh, Del Toro worked into the first one? Because like I remember, I mean, there was one where the hero Jaeger, piloted by Charlie Hunnam, uh, throws a punch and it goes through a building and it hits one of those little Newton's cradles things, those little desk toys with the uh, the swinging ball bearings, and it kind of like yeah. just nicks it just a little bit and starts them going back and forth. And like little moments like that are very char- very characteristically del toro kind of sight gags and i I, love to see them in movies like that to be honest i didn't really like that sight gag in pacific rim i i thought it was more funny when he took like a bunch of uh tankers and ships and used them as swords oh yeah and you saw like bikes and like tvs flying across the street i thought that was more interesting there there are sight gags in pacific rim uprising and they are almost exactly the same as the ones are del toro used in the first one no but because they're exactly the same they're not very interesting right of course so there is a gag where I think the Jaeger does something and it, it nicks something and it, it makes things move like or something like that. Pacific Rim itself is like if you if you can't buy into the fact that it's a movie about robots fighting monsters, I, I don't think it's just a film that you're going to ever understand. No, no. And I mean, like, I think I I think I started my review of the original Pacific Rim, something to the effect of like a movie like Pacific Rim has to pass the stupid test. It has to it has to do something different, different enough to help people get over the hump of like this premise is ridiculous. And, you know, in the hands of a direct to video schlockmeister, it would be awful. Yes. But because of because of some like magic sprinkles or something it's able to kind of clear that bar and actually be super entertaining yeah because um, and it's it's a hard hard thing to uh to, to track down what it is about something yeah there's there's a sense of scale and an and element of danger that del toro can bring out even in pan's labyrinth which i think is like a freaking creepy movie a terrifying movie and he has that ability to just bring tension and remember in the first part of pacific rim it was gypsy danger trying to save a fishing boat from a kaiju right right so there was there were stakes involved and you really got a good sense of of the height of this conflict the seriousness of this conflict but in the uprising i remember the first kind of battle was was between basically two jaegers and it was it was kind of fun to see them kind of like run around the city and do all sorts of stuff. 
but it never gave you a reason to root for anybody. So I, I think that's where it really falls apart. And, and, and again, I don't think it's the actor's fault. I, I just think it's a really poor plot and a really poor script. Well, I mean, it feels like the kind of thing that will eventually end up on Netflix. So I'll probably wait until then. Um, yes. Because my, my scene yeah. points are too valuable to me uh, to... Uh, uh, waste them on that from the sounds of it <laughs> but see i like wasting scene points on stupid movies because if if it's if it's good and i feel great if it's it's if it's bad i'll be like well at least it was a free ticket yeah true you know i think i might be using wine uh, on a um the new joaquin phoenix uh movie you were never really here mm-hmm. that's coming out soon yeah it's coming out i think limited really starts weekend of the sixth uh which is coming up for us on the the day we're recording this podcast so if it opens in here in Toronto uh, that weekend, I'll definitely be seeing that. Cool. I think that about does it for this episode. So head on over, as usual, shameless plug for uh, kinetoscope.ca, our site where we post full versions of all of our reviews. And uh, Well, it's a better plug than your Republic of Doyle plug. <laughs> <laughs> More likely to generate conversions. Yeah, so uh, kinetoscope.ca, uh, where we've got uh, new reviews of... Isle of Dogs, Ready Player One, and we'll have a review of Pacific Rim Uprising in the uh, the near future if it's uh, not already posted by the time you get this this episode. But until the next time, I'm Robert Snow in Toronto. And my name is Jason Chen in Vancouver. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs>